Hey, everybody. Welcome to Odd and Untold, the podcast where we talk about all things strange and spooky. And this week, despite all of my Bigfoot garb here, uh, I will not be talking about Bigfoot. I'm going to be talking about a place in the Himalayas, though, Mount Everest. Um, and uh, an odd and not too well-known story, not untold, but not too well-known either. I think it's uh, either something people aren't aware of or just choose not to really think about. Um, so it's, it's really the, the story of all the bodies that are on Mount Everest. Uh, before I get to that though, I just want to do a little housekeeping here. We had, uh, some birthdays that I missed last week. We did our 4th of July horror movie podcast last week. And, uh, I mentioned some family members of mine had 4th of July birthdays, including my son, Jake. Uh, but I missed a few people. So, uh, my good friend, Stacy, who, uh, I've ghost hunted with many times and I've known since we were probably 15, 16, uh, her son, Gavin. Uh, so happy birthday, Gavin, uh, July 4th birthday. And one of our biggest YouTube fans and one of our favorite fans, Ua Sparkly, not sure your real name, but you mentioned that you also had a 4th of July birthday. So happy birthday to you. I promised you a shout out. So there you go. Happy birthday. And uh, thanks for listening. And uh, I know you're a fan of the show and you're a fan of John's and he will be back. Um, but in, until then, happy birthday, Gavin. Happy birthday, Ua Sparkly. And uh, on to this week's topic. So yeah, this is a, a topic that I've wanted to talk about for a while. It's not really paranormal. It's not supernatural. It's just one of those sort of odd and unsettling stories. And as I mentioned, it's not that it's untold because there are articles about there about this, as you'll see. Um, but it's it's one of those things where I think a lot of people don't, like I said, they don't either realize that they don't know about this, or if they do, they just don't want to think about it. It is disturbing. Uh, before we go any further, I just want to give everyone a sort of warning here that there will be pictures in some of these articles if you're watching on YouTube or Spotify that are disturbing. There's going to be some pictures of some dead bodies, nothing extraordinarily graphic, but if those sorts of things disturb you, you might want to just listen audio only. Uh, we are on Apple, we are on Google, we're on Spotify as audio. So you can find us on your favorite pa podcasting platforms if you just want to listen this week and not see actual dead bodies, which will be shown on the websites that I'm referencing here. So yeah, it's just one of those things. And I'm going to get to the article in a second that I had known about. Now, I, I didn't know about this until many years ago. I was watching a show on the Discovery Channel. I think it was just called Everest. And it was kind of tracking a few different guys. Um, I think it was all male. I don't remember any female um, members of the team, really. It was focusing on like one or two men who were climbing Everest and it was just sort of documenting them at base camp and making their way up and sort of the struggles. And and they had mentioned that there were bodies on there. So this is a subject that I've been sort of fascinated by and, you know, horrified by for, for many years. And it came up again in conversation recently uh, with someone I was talking to and I wanted to do an episode on it. So I figured, let me do that now and just take a little break from the ghosts and the UFOs and the Bigfoot and lake monsters and all that good stuff and just focus on something a little bit more human, but still scary and still a little disturbing. And, and, you know, you could maybe tie this into ghosts. Um, is the Mount Everest haunted? I mean, there's a number of dead bodies up there. Many people have died up there. Uh, and many of the bodies remain. Uh, the conditions are just too tough to bring all the bodies back. So uh, very difficult topic. So once again, if you don't like seeing dead bodies, Go find us on your favorite podcast platform and just find the audio only version. Uh, but if you're okay with that and you want to continue watching, we'll get to it. Okay, so I'm going to be referencing this article uh, titled Why Mount Everest is Littered with the Dead Bodies of More Than 200 Fallen Climbers. This is by Katie Serena, edited by John Karoski. This is from allthatsinteresting.com. So just wanted to give them credit. Uh, and just from the title alone, you can see there's more than 200 fallen climbers on Mount Everest. Uh, so I'm going to just scroll down a little bit and read some of this. Uh, the top portion of the mountain, roughly everything above 26,000 feet, is known as the death zone. There, the oxygen levels are only at a third of what they are at sea level, and the barometric pressure causes weight to feel 10 times heavier. The combination of the two makes climbers feel sluggish, disoriented, and fatigued, and can cause extreme distress on organs. 
For this reason, climbers don't usually last more than 48 hours in this area. So again, the show that I used to watch, they would talk about the oxygen. They would talk about acclimating to different altitudes and they'd have to sort of climb and then kind of rest and climb and rest. And, and you know, that this is, you know, endurance of the human body. So very tough, very difficult for a lot of people unless they're trained for it and have the proper equipment. And even then things are going to go wrong. Things can go wrong anywhere. So it doesn't matter how good a shape you're in, how good, how well prepared you are. Mother nature, uh, you know, she wants to take you out. She's taking you out and let's move on. Uh, the climbers that do are usually left with lingering effects. The ones that aren't so lucky and die on Mount Everest are left right where they fell. To date, it's estimated that some 300 people have died climbing Earth's tallest mountain and that there are approximately 200 dead bodies on Mount Everest to this day. These are the stories behind just some of the bodies on Mount Everest that have accumulated over the years. So they're going to talk about some of the more famous or well-known bodies on Mount Everest that are still there. Uh, a, again, it's, it's tough for people to just climb up there, much less, uh, retrieve a dead body and bring it back down to base camp. It's just difficult getting yourself up and down there, much less another human being. So I'm going to talk about this one, this one I've heard about for a while here, and this is one of the most infamous, um, dead bodies on the mountain. And again, there's going to be a picture down here in a moment that you'll see. All right, so I'm going to talk here about one of the more infamous bodies, probably the most infamous body on the mountain. Uh, he's nicknamed Green Boots, and his identity is a little contentious, but they believe they know who he is. And again, before I continue, I'm going to warn you that there are pictures to follow. There's pictures of deceased human beings. So if this is not your jam, turn back now, go listen on an audio version of the podcast. And again, we're on every podcast platform. So just look for odd and untold and you'll find us and you can find this episode. Uh, so I'm going to read this entry about green boots. Standard protocol on Mount Everest is just to leave the dead right where they died. And so these Mount Everest bodies remain there to spend eternity on its slopes, serving as both a warning to other climbers, as well as gruesome mile markers. One of the most famous Mount Everest bodies known as green boots was passed by almost every climber to reach the death zone. The identity of Green Boots is highly contested, but it is most widely believed that it is Saswang Paljor, an Indian climber who died in 1996. And I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Sawang Paljor. For the body's recent removal, okay, so this one was removed, Green Boots' body rested near a cave that all climbers must pass on their way to the peak. The body became a grim landmark used to gauge how close one is to the summit. He is famous for his green boots, and because, according to one seasoned adventurer, about 80% of people also take a rest at the shelter where green boots is, and it's hard to miss the person lying there. So again, I'm going to scroll down, and you're going to see the photo of green boots. And there he is with his green boots. Um, and the cave. So again, very sad that this person perished there. And you know, again, signature for his green boots. I'm, I'm glad they, they got his body off the mountain. I think any body that can be retrieved should be retrieved, but I also understand that many of them can't. Uh, I know from just watching that show that I mentioned and other sources that uh, there's a lot of glaciers on Mount Everest and it just looks like snow, but it'll cover chasms and you could just be walking in the snow thinking you're walking on solid ground and there could just be a crevasse there and you could fall right into it. So just very treacherous and very sad that these people have died on the mountain, just trying to overcome. Um, and so related to this, we're now going to move on to David Sharp and I'll read again from the article in 2006, another climber joined green boots in his cave and became one of the most infamous Mount Everest bodies in history. David Sharp was attempting to summit Everest on his own, a feat which even the most advanced climbers would warn against. He had stopped to rest in Green Boots' cave, as so many had done before him. Over the course of several hours, he froze to death, his body stuck in a huddled position, just feet from one of the most well-known Everest bodies. Unlike Green Boots, however, who had likely gone unnoticed during his death due to the small amount of people hiking at the time, at least 40 people passed by Sharp that day. Not one of them stopped. So... That's a very sad part of this story. Uh, a couple of things to note here. One, he was attempting to do this climb by himself, which 
I'm really against almost anything in nature alone. Uh, I, I just think there's too much that can go wrong. And while I do see the appeal of getting out in nature and kind of being by yourself and alone with your thoughts and, and just being able to, you know, tell yourself, like, I conquered this, I did this, I, I, you know, did this alone. That's very dangerous. And, um, it's funny because my, my buddy, Josh Diaz, who's been on the show many times, he's done a few solo camping trips and that's kind of how we met. Cause he posted a video on YouTube of one of his solo trips, uh, with his dog Jax, but it was just him. Um, his dog is with him, but his dog can't, you know, call 911 or go get the ranger, <laughs> you know? So he's still for all intents and purposes alone. And we have discussed doing solo trips. We discussed me doing a solo trip. And as, as much as I would like to do it, it, it does frighten me as well because I'm the one who, you know, the first time I'm out there, I'll twist my ankle or I'll cut myself or I'll do something where I need help and <laughs> I won't have it. So it does make me a little nervous and we've kind of maybe worked out a way where we could get the solo camping experience without actually being alone and not too, too far from one another and or out of range with walkie talkies. So we're, we're still working on that trip and hoping to get that one going. But again, it, I don't recommend anybody do anything where you're away from rescue by yourself because when it's just you and something goes wrong, there's no one to help you. So that was the first point. The second point, he stopped to rest in this cave and, and hikers just passed him by. And, and there's probably a couple of reasons for that. And, you know, on the more optimistic side, you know, people would rest in this cave. So many people passing him probably thought he just went in there to rest and was perhaps napping or just, you know, not seeing them or just not moving because he was trying to conserve energy so on the one hand, I try to be optimistic and, and give these people the benefit of the doubt for not checking on him by just simply thinking he's just another hiker who's resting there and doesn't need assistance. On the flip side of that, you have a lot of uh, selfishness where people just want to get to the top and they're not really concerned with other people. They just want to focus on their hike, focus on their climb and focus on their goal. And I would think that anybody passing him, even if you just assume he's sleeping, even if you assume he's fine, it doesn't take much time to just check on someone, to holler to them, to just try to get a wave out of them and say, hey, are you okay? Um, so very sad, again, that he did this. And again, I fully understand the desire to want to do it alone, but this is a story that sort of illustrates my point as to why I wouldn't recommend it to pretty much anyone just doesn't matter how good a shape you're in, how well prepared you are. Mother nature can take you out very easily and surprisingly. So here's a picture of David Sharp. And uh, again, very sad, not his dead body, but just a photo of him when he was still alive. So very sad to have lost him. So I'll keep reading from the article here. Sharp's death sparked a moral debate about the culture of Everest climbers. Though many had passed by Sharp as he lay dying, and their eyewitness accounts claim he was visibly alive and in distress, no one offered their help. Sir Edmund Hillary, the first man to ever summit the mountain, alongside Tenzing Norgay, criticized the climbers who had passed by Sharp and attributed it to mind-numbing desire to reach the top. Quote, If you have someone who is in great need, and you are still strong and energetic, then you have a duty, really, to give all that you can to get the man down, and getting to the summit becomes very secondary, he told the New Zealand Herald after news of Sharp's death broke. So here we have confirmation that he was in distress and people probably saw that and just chose to turn a blind eye to it. So very sad because, again, that would have affected their own climb. If they have to bring someone back down, he obviously would have needed help. So to to leave him up there uh, simply because they wanted to reach the summit, very sad, very tragic, and just very disturbing that human beings uh, would do that to one another. Uh, so to continue from Sir Edmund Hillary here, I think the whole attitude towards climbing Mount Everest has become rather horrifying, he added. The people just want to get to the top. They don't give a damn for anybody who else may be in distress, and it doesn't impress me at all that they leave someone lying under a rock to die. The media term this phenomenon summit fever, and it's happened more times than most people realize. So again, very sad. Uh, 
you know, and again, people pay lots of money to summit Everest and a lot of time and they're away from their families and it takes a lot of planning. So, you know, to, to just turn a blind eye to this, to someone in hell, in need of help, you know, you can try to make all the excuses you want that I paid money. I took a lot of time. I'm away from my family, but to leave someone there to die is very, very sad. So, uh, may he rest in peace as well. All right. So moving on to George Mallory and uh, how George Mallory became the first dead body on Mount Everest. In 1999, the oldest known body to ever fall on Mount Everest was found. George Mallory's body was found 75 years after his 1924 death after an unusually warm spring. Mallory had attempted to be the first person to climb Everest, though he had disappeared before anyone found out if he had achieved his goal. And again, we have a picture of a body here, a bit gruesome. Uh, so I apologize for that, but that's what we're talking about here today. So uh, to continue from the article, his body was found in 1999, his upper torso, half of his legs and his left arm almost perfectly preserved. He was dressed in a tweed suit and surrounded by primitive climbing equipment and heavy oxygen bottles. A rope injury around his waist led those who found him to believe he had been roped to another climber when he fell from the side of a cliff. It is still unknown whether Mallory made it to the top, though. Of course, the title of the first man to climb Everest has been attributed elsewhere. Though he may not have made it, rumors of Mallory's climb have swirled for years. So again, you can see the body here, uh, very well preserved, considering uh, it's been there since, you know, almost 100 years now, we're talking 99 years, um, found in 1999, but we're in 2023 now, and if he went missing in 2024, a uh, long time, very sad. He was a famous mountaineer at the time, and when asked why he wanted to climb the then unconquered mountain, he famously replied, because it's there. So that's kind of where we get that saying, you know, why do you want to do this? Because it's there. Why do you want to climb Everest? Because it's there. Uh, and again, as someone who loves camping and loves sort of challenging myself, I, I do appreciate what these guys went through and, and why they went through it of just trying to conquer your inner demons, you know, prove something to yourself, push yourself. But, you know, nobody deserves to die for that. You know, I, I think it's very sad that it happens. It's just a fact of life. I mean, even just regular campers and hikers die um, in tragic accidents. So again, just you always have to be careful and, and try to buddy up. Uh, Mallory seems to have been with someone else. So I don't know where that story kind of got lost. I mean, if somebody was tied to him, did that person also die? Why was that person not reported missing? It's possible it was a Sherpa, you know, someone local from the region, and it just didn't make it into Western media. But again, very sad. Okay, so we're going to continue here. And this is a first because it is the first woman uh, to have her dead body on the mountain. Uh, the sad demise of Hanalore Schmatz in Everest's death zone. One of the most horrifying sights on Mount Everest is the body of Hanalore Schmatz. In 1979, Schmatz became not only the first German citizen to perish on the mountain, but also the first woman. Schmatz had actually reached her goal of summiting the mountain before ultimately succumbing to exhaustion on the way down. Despite her Sherpa's warning, she set up camp within the death zone. So here you have someone who's already summited. They've gotten to the top and on the way down, uh, something goes wrong and she perished. Uh, she managed to survive a snowstorm hitting overnight and made it almost the rest of the way down to camp before a lack of oxygen and frostbite resulted in her giving into exhaustion. She was only 330 feet from base camp. So very close and very sad. And once again, there's going to be a gruesome photo here. And it's very disturbing. Um, you can see her skull. You can see the jeans she's wearing, uh, her feet, her shoulder, her hands. Uh, very sad. Um, again, especially that she was so close to base camp. So I'll continue here. Her body remains on the mountain, extremely well-preserved due to the consistently below zero temperatures. She remained in plain view of the mountain's southern route, leaning against a long deteriorated backpack with her eyes open and her hair blowing in the wind until the 70 to 80 mile per hour winds either blew a covering of snow over her or pushed her off the mountain. Her final resting place is unknown. It's due to the same things that kill these climbers that recovery of their bodies can't take place. So as I mentioned, it's the reason that these people are dying is the reason why it's so hard to rescue them because now you're putting other people 
in danger. You have extreme weather conditions. You have extreme heights. You have very little air and oxygen supply. It's very tough to mount and probably very expensive to mount rescues for these bodies. And it's it's very sad, but that's what happens. So to finish this article, when someone dies on Everest, especially in the death zone, it is almost impossible to retrieve the body. The weather conditions, the terrain, and the lack of oxygen makes it difficult to get to the bodies. Even if they can be found, they're usually stuck to the ground, frozen in place. In fact, two rescuers died while trying to recover Schmatz's body, and countless others have perished while trying to reach the rest. Despite the risks and the bodies they will encounter, thousands of people flock to Everest every year to attempt this impressive feat. And while it isn't even known for sure how many bodies are on Mount Everest today, these corpses have done nothing to dissuade other climbers. And some of those brave mountaineers are sadly destined to join the bodies on Mount Everest themselves. So, one, to get back to Schmatz, uh, her body is now gone. They don't know if a snowdrift has covered it up and they just can't find it now, or if the winds pushed her body off the mountain and, like I said earlier, into a crevasse, and they'll just never find it. So, very sad. And as I also mentioned, just very risky to have people try to retrieve the bodies and it seems as many other people have died just trying to do that, not even trying to get to the summit, but just trying to rescue people who've, who've climbed uh, and not being successful with that. So um, very sad. And um, that is the end of this article, but yeah, it's one of those things that always struck me very grim reminder. And, and we don't see that too often. Um, you know, we, we have cemeteries and people go ghost hunting at cemeteries and it's spooky and, but the bodies are underground. Uh, you know, we're not really exposed to dead bodies much, especially when doing something dangerous. I think if you're doing something like climbing on Everest, knowing the risks and you're just passing dead bodies and seeing that these people perished doing what you are now trying to do and that it easily could become you very sad, very difficult thing to do. Very tough, very, very tough. So um, th these are just some of the more, more famous uh, cases of people who've died on the mountain. There there are more. All right, so I've moved on to a different article. This has a few more people and some of the, some people that we've already discussed, but I just wanted to, to talk about a few more people who've perished on Mount Everest and just kind of give some, some more closure to that. So this is from a website called endorphine.com. And I will link to all these in the description below. Uh, but here we have Green Boots. There's a picture of him when he was still alive. And then, of course, the photo uh, of him in the cave. And uh, it does say here, in 2014, the Chinese government removed his body from the main trail and buried it beneath snow and rock at his family's request. So it looks like he might still... Uh, it's hard to tell from this, but it sounds almost like he's still on the mountain, but just buried and not out in plain sight anymore, which is a relief just to the family and I'm sure to everybody climbing the mountain. Another one, uh, Dub Sleeping Beauty, which I wanted to talk about. It wasn't mentioned in the other article. Uh, in 1988, the couple Francis and Sergei Ars Arsentiev ascended Everest. Francis was the first American woman to attempt the climb without oxygen. So uh, that's alarming to me. She and her husband reached the summit, but never completed the return trip. And here's some photos of her. Francis became separated from her spouse on the descent to Camp 6. Sergei returned to look for her and received news from an Uzbek group, Uzbek group of climbers that they had found Francis and tried to help, but she could not travel. Sergei and Francis both lost their lives on the mountain. Francis's body became a marker known as Sleeping Beauty. She rests covered in an American flag with a teddy bear tucked under her arm from fellow explorer Ian Woodhall. Her husband's body went undiscovered until a year after her passing. Sergei had fallen down the mountain. So, again, just goes to show that just trying to retrieve the bodies can be risky and difficult and deadly. Rob Hall, 1996 Everest disaster. The 2015 release of the film Everest depicts the story and demise of mountaineer Rob Hall. He was one of the world's most famous climbing athletes. He, alongside his close friend Gary Ball, completed this seven summits challenge by climbing the world's seven tallest mountains. Hall's adventuring came to an end with the 1996 Everest disaster. Hall led an expedition up the mountain in early May. A series of unfortunate events led to the expedition becoming trapped during one of Everest's violent snowstorms. Rob and one of his expedition members, Doug Hansen, died during the storm. Several other climbers on separate expeditions passed in the same storm. 
And there's a link here to that whole disaster. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that with Scott Fisher. The storm of 1996 also took the life of seasoned mountaineer Scott Fisher. During the ascent with his Mountain Madness group, Fisher successfully reached the summit. However, he began to suffer from exhaustion. Fisher sent his expedition team on ahead when the storm struck, knowing he would slow them down. Unfortunately, he lost his life during the storm. So again, very sad. Just like I said, Mother Nature can come in and no matter how well prepared you are, no matter how experienced you are, no matter what great a shape you're in, when Mother Nature unleashes, it can be very, very terrible. Uh, so here's George Mallory again. I'm not going to revisit that. Here's David Sharp. And again, there's a photo of Mr. Sharp's body here. Uh, he was with Green Boots in the small cave, Hanelor Schmatz, uh, which we've already discussed. And here's a photo of her when she was still alive. So this next one, I'm going to try to pronounce his name properly, Shreya Shah Chlorphene. And she was one of the 12 climbers who died in 2012 on Everest. It was one of the mountain's deadliest years since the 1996 disaster. Shreya successfully summited the mountain, but remained too long, using up excess oxygen as she captured the moment on camera. On the descent down, Shreya suffered from exhaustion. She passed at 26,246 feet. Her body remained on the mountain, draped in a Canadian flag for a time. Her body was later retrieved to base camp and removed from the mountain. So here's a picture of her body with the Canadian flag over it. Uh, so I think we're going to stop there. Uh, there. There's many more. These are really just among the most famous. Uh, I'm going to go to the Sleeping Beauty story. I don't know if there's a, a photo of her body. I've seen them uh, here. Perhaps we have it. Uh, so yeah, just very sad. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now because I don't like looking at the dead bodies myself, but it is a fact of life and it is a fact for anybody climbing Everest or visiting there that there are dead bodies there and just out in the open for anyone to see and anyone climbing anyway. And like I said earlier, we just, you know, we are a society that sort of shuns death and doesn't like to talk about death. It's sort of taboo in in western society and you know I, I just think that why it affected me just hearing these stories and knowing that like there's bodies still up there like nobody went and got them and it seems like something that should be done but at the same time very difficult very dangerous very tough to justify going up and getting the bodies as much as the family may want the remains uh it's just a daunting task and very sad uh so Again, to sort of tie it into the paranormal, I really don't want to, but you know, you could make a case for that perhaps Everest is haunted. I, it's part of the Himalayas, so you have, you know, Bigfoot and Yeti and the abominable snowman stories from the Himalayas, and and that's kind of what it's more famous for as far as spooky stuff. And again, most people don't really talk about because it's untold uh, the, the bodies on Everest, and it's just something I wanted to cover. And uh, just pay my respects to those who have died on the mountain, who are still on the mountain, whose bodies will never be retrieved. Very sad. You know, these people just wanted to enjoy nature and conquer one of nature's great summits. And uh, I remember watching the show back in the day and just thinking, this looks really cool. I do a lot of winter camping now myself, and it's just it it's it's a very cool thing. But that's a far cry from trying to summit Everest and going without oxygen and and just the you know you're not on a trail you know you're, you're climbing up a mountain you're not on a a, a well-maintained trail in the adirondacks or in the catskills that just happens to have you know a couple of feet of snow over it where again if you're just careful enough you'll probably be okay and i have been so far thankfully but josh and i do love winter camping and as cold as it can get i can only imagine how cold it gets on everest and then you take into account the terrain and the heights and the, the lack of oxygen I can't even imagine because we've spent a few nights in in the woods where we were just like, why do we do this to ourselves? Uh, but again, it's that human spirit of just wanting to push yourself and see how far you can go. And I don't think I'll ever push myself that hard. Um, like I said, Everest is is appealing in certain ways, but in many ways, not so much. So going to wrap it up there, everybody. So thanks for tuning in again this week. It's a little bit of a shorter episode, but we went a little bit long last week. So for our 4th of July episode, and it, it's much more fun when I'm talking to John or Josh or Scott or anybody else who comes on the show. 
Um, I don't like talking for too long when it's just me. Um, so if you're watching this on YouTube, please give the video a like if you liked it. Please give us a subscribe if you like our channel and you haven't done so already. Or if you're just finding us for the first time, give us a subscribe. Uh, it really helps the channel. And click the little bell there. It'll give you notifications when I post a new video. Most of my podcasts come out every Tuesday, but every now and then I'll do like a little bonus content, some news or some, you know, little bonus episode for when I'm in the Adirondacks or just, you know, strictly video only. You're not going to find it on the podcasting platforms. If you're listening on a podcasting platform, please uh, give us a review. Uh, click the stars, as many stars as you think we deserve. If you want to leave us a written review, we'd love that. We love hearing your feedback, but just giving us the stars that also helps, you know, sort of give us a rating and a ranking. So uh, yeah, thanks for joining me again this week, everybody. And until next week, rock and roll.